It's tasting time! Well, I figured since I was already embarrassing myself on the internet, that I might as well go that extra mile. Though this is leading me to wonder what will my future reviews look like. Hello, it's -a me, Mario! And today, we are going to review New Super Mario Brothers Wii! Well, here we go, Volume 6 and Volume 7. But first, a tangent. In case you were wondering why this took so long, the pure suckage of Metroid Other M put me into a coma and destroyed all the joy and happiness in my life. So that's my explanation as to why this review is so bitter. Also, it turns out that Metroid and Pokémon take place in the same universe. Also, Ridley is actually a Pokémon. He is some really screwed up combination of an Incarta, Garchomp, a Bleach, Torchic, Drapion, and perhaps there's also a little bit of Zubat in there. Jeez, no wonder it keeps coming back. I guess Samus didn't know about that whole if you bear your sword and bring harm upon us with claws and fangs we will exact a toll part of the mythos. Regardless, I can't wait until Pokemon Space Pirate version when I can train my own Ridley. What was I doing before this again? Right, a review. The first time I read this manga, I blitzed through the first 29 volumes, not actually paying much attention, and I found it quite enjoyable. While rereading this series for these reviews, I've been finding it not as stellar. I like this series, but rereading it from the beginning I couldn't remember why, and even now I'm not sure. Hopefully by the end of this, I'll have a concrete answer. I ultimately felt that you couldn't separate the two volumes, so we're going to go through this in the order that you face the Elite Four in the games. So, Lorelai, Bruno, Agatha, and then Lance. Please know in the actual manga that they constantly jump around and the actual order is like this. Let's start. Lorelai, Ice Voodoo, where do I begin? Ultimately, I feel that Lorelai's powers are tacked on and weren't given much thought. As I said before, there is next to no reason why Yellow should have escaped her encounter with Lorelai. Here is how the ice voodoo works. Jinx makes an ice doll and Lorelai marks an X on it with her lipstick. Where there is an X, an ice snowflake appears, trapping the target. The ice can then expand until eventually encasing the target. Supposedly, it is also a rather close range attack as seen in the fire red and leaf green chapter. Finally, if the dolls are damaged, the same damage appears on the person or Pokémon. Anyways, Green and Sabrina are quickly chained together, which really doesn't work out that well for them. Due to Lorelai's embarrassing situation of letting Yellow escape and not blaming the person who is truly responsible, herself, she only attacks Green. And soon Green is knocked unconscious. All Sabrina is able to do alone is knock out Cloyster. Lorelai taunts Sabrina, saying that there is a way to detach herself from Green. It involves cutting off Green's hand. Of course, Viz censors it and vaguely alludes to it, which, as usual, I find incredibly stupid. Also, I'm really wondering how they are going to handle a lot of things in the future story arcs. Mask of Ice's entire motivation is to prevent two deaths. The end of the Ruby Sapphire arc has three important named characters die on page. And then there is the origin of the Big Bad in the Emerald arc, which works out like this. Kill each other with your bare hands while I watch on for the lulls. Unfortunately, Sabrina loses her grip, and she falls down into the abyss with green, and they die horrible, painful deaths. In order to make sure that there was no chance of them surviving, Lorelai takes the ice voodoo dolls and smashes them against the ground, rendering both Green and Sabrina into a million tiny little pieces. Then, in an incredibly shocking turn, Lorelai reveals that she has had enough of following orders and kills everyone else on the island using her ice voodoo. She reveals that the only reason she let Yellow live and escape was so that Yellow could weaken Lance. She then begins her cold reign upon the world as Mask of Ice, and we turn to the Johto region for a new hero to step forwards. And that's where Viz ended this series in the first print. Those bastards. Okay, so that didn't happen, but still. It turns out that during the whole battle, Green was playing possum. They fly up using Blastoise, and we go into exposition mode. And what occurs is the most unbelievable coincidence I have ever seen. Green learns from an extremely feminine and mysterious looking silver about Lance's evil plan to take control of a flying Pokemon, and that Lance has mysterious powers. And, by pure coincidence, she sees Red's Pikachu fleeing from the battle and being chased by Hitmonlee, then loses it in the Viridian Forest, meets up with Yellow, learns about her powers, and that she just conveniently happens to know Red. Then Green sets Yellow on her quest. Anyways, the only reason that Green just said all this was because she is actually the daughter of Light and everything just went as planned. Lorelai was so distracted by the flashback that she didn't notice Cliff Fable stealing the dolls from Cloyster, who was supposed to be knocked out by Sabrina earlier in the battle, and was acknowledged as such. You know, there's this little thing called continuity. USE IT! 
And we now have another thing to add to that long list of disturbing content that Viz keeps, but for some reason continues to cut most references to death. Green's arm is torn off. So, Viz, it's completely okay to show this, but not to allude to this in the text. Or is this okay to show because it actually turns out that it's Ditto in disguise? Then, Green is able to win by using Ditto to heroically squeeze Lorelei until she is unconscious. Now, let's play a game. It's called How Many Pokémon Did Lorelei Use in the Battle? She used three, while the appendix in Volume 5 shows her with five Pokémon. Not appearing in this battle is Lapras and Dugong, and this sets up a theme. Both Agatha and Bruno follow suit and give up when they have two more Pokémon remaining. So that was Lorelei's fight. In a word, I'd describe it as bad. With Lorelei's ice voodoo power, she is one of the strongest humans in the entire manga, and would be capable of killing anyone instantly. But the blame for this fight just doesn't go to Lorelei. The ice voodoo wasn't absurd enough for you. Note that Green had everything planned since she landed on the island, down to knowing about Lorelei's completely unrevealed ice voodoo powers. The only time that they were shown before this was in a flashback. To make this even more absurd, she even knew the arm that Lorelei would target. For the love of crap, Green's Pokédex ability is evolving, not complete hypnosis. So Bruno is next. Is his fight as disappointing as Lorelei's? No, it's awesome! The battle takes place on two wild onyx acting as a bridge over a pool of acid. And to prove how badass he is, Bruno doesn't even let out his Pokémon to start the fight. When he does bring out his Pokémon, Lieutenant Surge and Bill are pretty much screwed until they try to blow up the bridge. Bruno survives and Lieutenant Surge is knocked down towards the acid. Luckily, by using the SPOONS OF DESTINY, Red shows up and saves Lieutenant Surge. Meanwhile, Yellow and Blaine were watching the fight behind a transparent rock wall. Just when it looks like they will finally reunite, a torrent of water knocks both Yellow and Blaine away. And then the reveal happens. Yellow is a girl! That would have almost been effective and shocking if it wasn't the first thing I learned about this series. So now it's time for the rematch of the century, badass versus badass, and you're expecting a pure testosterone-driven battle that rivals the battle in Berserk. Unfortunately, what we get is a battle that is over nine pages. The main Pokémon Red uses is Eevee, and by using the special evolutionary stones, he is able to evolve freely between any of the three evolutions. After Bruno's Hitmonchan and Champ are knocked unconscious, Bruno admits defeat. And he says that he never agreed with the plans of the other members of the Elite Four. The whole reason that he was there was to find the perfect opponent. Despite having two more Pokémon, he walks away satisfied with a good battle. And since I rag so much on Viz for their stupid mistakes, here's one from the Singapore version. They call Flareon by its Japanese name, Booster. On one hand, I enjoy this battle. Bruno is a giant badass, and he doesn't rely on his Pokémon. Plus, Pokéball nunchucks! On the other... I do have to complain about how this battle was cut short. He is looking for the perfect opponent, and he shows his gratitude to Red by quitting partway through. Wouldn't he want to continue battling Red? It just seems sloppy. Also, I think a rematch would have more plot importance over Miss I can't admit my own mistakes and will blame everyone else, and Miss I'm old and cranky about Professor Oak deciding to go follow his dreams and leave me behind so I will take it out on his grandson. And I would have really loved to see more Eevee awesomeness. However, it is established that Eevee goes through a lot of pain for these evolutions. Although there is one thing I have to point out. Throughout this battle, Red is on a bicycle. And it isn't until two volumes later you find out why. Due to his battle against Bruno, Agatha, and Lorelei, and being a victim of ice voodoo, his hands and feet occasionally go numb. I find this incredibly stupid that he would be riding on his bicycle, as I believe that that would be more dangerous. If his hands go numb and he loses control of where he is steering, he could fall into that pit of acid, not to mention the complete lack of a helmet, while you're in a rock cave where you could fall and split your head open at any moment. Keep being good role models there, kids! It's also nice seeing them not walk away from battle unscratched. In the year that it takes Red and Sabrina to cure the damage from the ice voodoo, they both go through a bit of pain. The only exception of the characters not living with the consequences of battle is at the end of the Ruby Sapphire arc where they pretty much shout, Let's revive everyone with the Dragon Balls! So now it's time for Agatha's battle. If you thought Lorelei's battle was stupid, dear merciful crap, not even the editors were able to be protected from this! Agatha fights from the shadows in order to ambush both Koga and Blue. It starts off as a mirror match between two Golbats and two Arbox, and thankfully Agatha's Pokémon do look different. During the fight, Koga's Arbok loses a portion of its tail by Agatha's Arbok biting it. Yeah, screw it, I'm doing this joke. And apparently, a bite is capable of a clean cut and not taking a giant chunk of skin out of you. It is also revealed that it can grow back at a speed that puts Cell to shame as long as its head is okay. And that's how it survived that incident in Volume 1. Which completely ignores the fact that Viz referred to it as a zombie Arbok in their translation. Isn't censorship fun? I didn't mention this earlier due to two reasons. The first, I didn't notice. And the second, zombies are awesome! 
And if we go by Viz's translation, this also means that Koga has access to either a Celebi or the Dragon Balls and can revive the dead. Getting back on track, Agatha's Arbok's special ability is to change its pattern, which gives it immunities. For instance, here we learn that they wasted five whole panels that could have been used for something else, like Bruno's fight, for Arbok to change to be immune to poison, despite the fact that it is a poison type and is already immune to poison. Not to mention that both parties involve specialized in poison type Pokémon. WHY THE FUCK DID THIS HAPPEN? Okay, stop, time out. I have two things I want to quickly talk about. The first, I have absolutely no recollection if in the Generation 1 games a poison type Pokémon could be poisoned. So if in fact they could, and I'm actually just harping on the manga for a mistake that I'm making and thinking that something that came in later was in fact uh, not implemented in Generation 1, I apologize. The second thing, how the hell is Dendo able to travel around in this clothing? I'm doubly uncomfortable enough as it is just doing this review. There's no way, shape, or form that this is actually practical for traveling. You now returning to watching me bitch. Also, here is another disturbing thing to add to our list of content that Viz keeps in the manga. Koga orders his Golbat to use Leech Life on himself, so he uses his own blood to obscure the symbols on Agatha's Arbok. And this is perfectly fine, but we can't have a death threat towards a named character. What is it about text? Why can we show these images but not have the words die written down? Can someone please explain this to me, or will the actual explanation destroy my mind? They think that they have won. Apparently both of them have the memory span of 10 minutes and have forgotten about the Gengar which had temporarily blinded Blue. They are also unable to put together that perhaps Agatha trained her Pokémon to fight when she isn't there. For instance, what just happened during part of the previous battle, and what Koga did back in Volume 1 in Lavender Tower. So they walk away. However, they are trapped in a maze that Agatha had prepared earlier, and are lost for absolutely no damn reason besides for the fact that the fight isn't over yet. Meanwhile, Agatha wakes up and has a flashback. She's pissed off and wants Blue's head because when she was younger, Professor Oak used a dizzy punch on her Gengar. Please keep in mind that this was written before the ability Scrappy existed. Fucking Miltank. There was also something about abandoning a science group due to corruption and pursuing his own dreams of creating the Pokédex or something. And is it just me, but during this flashback they both look exactly the same. Well, fine, Agatha has earrings and her hair is slightly different and she doesn't have a cane, but damn, they've both aged incredibly well. She then promises that Oak will see his grandson again in heaven, which isn't censored in Viz's version, which is strange since she's implying she's going to kill them both. Upon getting back where they started and making sure that their dunce hats are on tight, they notice that Agatha is no longer there. They find themselves back where they started because they are suddenly unable to actually jump over the stalactites to find the exit to the maze. Or maybe they are just deterred by the stalactites magically changing sizes from panel to panel. Okay fine, Koga is suffering from blood loss right now and he probably isn't thinking straight. And since his strategy was to poison a poison Pokemon, we already know he's a moron. But that stops Blue from doing what he did earlier in the fight, how? They both thought that Agatha was unconscious and that the battle was over. This is just jarring! Koga is a ninja, not to mention a former Team Rocket executive, and Blue is supposed to be an expert strategist. Not to mention, he was training with Scyther in the fifth volume by cutting rocks. Suddenly he is unable to use Scyther to cut through the maze? How? Why? Scyther is able to cut through things without form, but now we can't even cut through rocks? If the cave was going to collapse, it would have collapsed when Agatha first used Rock Slide, not when Scyther turned some rocks into a fine powdered dust. And apparently they don't even try to do basic first aid to help Koga. You could just raise Koga's arm above his head and use gravity to lessen the blood loss. You know what? Screw it! Why am I expecting such things when the highest form of education shown in this world is a kindergarten class? And the children are allowed to travel the world at the age of 10! Okay, actually, there is one mention of college in Volume 6, but the context was as a joke, so take from that what you will. We also learned that Blue's special dex ability isn't to be a trainer, it is actually to state the obvious and waste valuable page space on things that the audience already knows, like Arbok versus Arbok! Look, I realize that the main demographic for this is kids, but they are smarter than you think they are, and they can figure out things that happen in the panel directly above it! Speaking of being smarter than people think you are, this reminds me of a puzzle. Koga and Blue are being attacked from the shadows by a Gengar. In this panel is a secret message that is crucial to the entire fight. What does the secret message say? Viz, your job is to translate the manga. DO IT! The kanji says tail. And this wasn't translated why? Did you think that kids could reach kanji? Did you think that kids would actually figure out since the message was shown after the fight concluded? Somehow the stupidity involved in this fight actually affected the translators. Actually, on second thought, I can't blame them. They were probably as sick as looking at this fight as I am. Also, apparently, Arbok has psychic powers and can make his detached tails dance to make sound. 
With Gengar defeated, Agatha is no longer able to fight, despite the fact that she has done next to nothing and still has two Pokémon in reserve and her opponents are in worse shape than she is. Agatha also shows that her memory is going. She says that she has obtained lots of damage from her battle with Koga, which is news to me because she was only hit by one attack and that was from Blue. So she escapes never to be seen again. Good riddance. Although this is odd since she seemed to be the brains behind the operation.